Hey everyone, we're taking a look at chapter four of our text, thinking more about classroom management and the learning environments that we have, the ways that we support and scaffold learners. In this area, we're specifically unwrapping and peeling away some of the layers that impact peer relationships and then bullying uh, in our classroom. So if we take a look at where we've been and where we're going in this chapter, um, we're thinking a little bit about uh, the research on peer relationships, we're thinking about how to foster positive peer relationships, um, identifying and supporting those students that are a bit isolated in our classroom, and then taking a look at some of the research on bullying. Bullying can be one of those wicked problems that's hard to unpack in our classrooms and think about how we support students. So once again, if we think about the classroom interaction loops, we know that there is this ecosystem that exists um, and it, it impacts uh, the, the student with interactions and positive or negative uh, connections with the teacher, with peers, with different content. We've talked about this in, in previous uh, discussions. When we think about the value of positive peer relationships, um, we know that it provides several important elements. Many of us can identify times in our life that we've been successful um, in a learning experience or in a club or on a team because of relationships that we had with others. They provide uh, positive social skills. They improve our self-esteem. Um, they may, they show evidence. We see evidence that uh, positive peer relationships can impact or compensate for stressful home life. Um, they also, if we have a positive peer relationship, there might be uh, decreased intimidation and isolation. We see decreased incidences of bullying. And then also we generally support students to get a sense of belonging and try and make those connections with others. When we think about cohesion in the group or how do we create that sense of belonging or that, that uh, connection or culture in our classroom, we know that Groups generally are unique instances, generally groups are cooperative existences or entities, um, and then groups can operate interdependently, interdependently, there we go, from one another. Uh, that means that some groups interact with one another's, but they can also exist on their own. And it's important to set the tone early within the group. Um, by identifying what's the identity, what's the purpose, what's the feedback structures, you know, what are the, who's in the group, what's the purpose of the group, what's the role of members of the group, and then how do we express ourselves if we don't like the way that things are heading. At the beginning of the year, many of you talked about the need to or the desire to build community and build up that culture. So there's different ways that we can do this. We can uh, have a scavenger hunt. We can bring things in from home or bring things in from our lives that have value to us. Um, have students roam around uh, interacting with others in the group to see what connections might be there. We might have instances where we have a discussion and we would ask students, which one of these is not true? Uh, in our distance ed course here at the college, um, we have uh, an icebreaker activity where we basically ask participants to share uh, two truths and one lie. And then they talk about what is the truth, you know, what's the lie and what you've shared. And then also just very simply have students get together and talk about what are some of the similarities and differences that we have, um, you know, in our different lives. Um, you know, it's super simple. It's a, it's an easy way to start off the year. It's an easy icebreaker. It doesn't have to be just at the beginning of the year. It might be throughout the year. It might be something that we continuously come back to. Um, you know, and it could be a scavenger hunt. It could be the two truths, one lie. It could be, okay, uh, in your group, we're going to do some peer evaluation or peer review of our content. Um, what are some things, what are some similarities and differences in you as a group? Um, it might be a good way to get started uh, as people get together and say hi with one another. Some other ideas that we can have, we can talk about um, learning people's names. What is the, uh, the origin story of your name? What's the purpose of your name? Um, sometimes people have very specific origin stories uh, in their names. 
Uh, we can have literacy activities. Sometimes wordplay, rhyme play is a fun way to bring groups together. We like laughing together. Uh, student directory, we often have students in, especially early childhood elementary, they bring in photos from home or bring in photos of the family or important people, maybe pets, so that the student can feel a connection in the classroom. And then you can see, you can make that connection. Other students can make connection with other kids and their family. Um, you talk about likes and dislikes and types of candy or food or songs that you like. Um, and then I, I really like the marooned activity. I don't really view it as being marooned. I, one of the activities that I use a lot, I used it a lot in middle grades and high school, and I use it now in my higher ed courses is, you know, what's the soundtrack or the playlist of your life? So what are the top 10 songs or the top 10 albums that are very important to you and why? What would you, you know, you, you know, they really emphasize or they epitomize who you are. Other things that we can do as a group to build cohesion, to build connectivity in the group is thinking about a team name or a mascot or a mission or a color or, you know, class pets. You know, we often see classrooms that will bring in the 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 bunny or the hamster or the fish tank. Um, I had fish tanks in my classroom. Um, you know, there are places that could be sharing circles or areas where we specifically identify things that make us who we are. Um, we have opportunities to um, create those bonds so that we can be a team. One of the, my favorite activities, um, and it's not really an activity, it's more of a habit of mind, is ask three than ask me. And, and the nice thing about that is far too often in our classroom, our students think they're supposed to always go to you as the classroom teacher for the be all end all answer. And I think that can be problematic at times. The student just relies on going to the teacher at all times. And instead, we can say to them, hey, guess what? Like, go to two or three of your peers, ask them if they know, and then come to me. Um, if you want feedback on an assignment, if you want feedback on your writing or a piece of art you made, um, go ask three of your peers and then come to me after you've done this. Um, I do this somewhat in some of my higher ed courses. I uh, use tools like peer grade where you will review and give feedback to each other's work. I think it's a powerful way to shift responsibility and power in the classroom. We also see the, uh, in terms of sharing the wealth and sharing the responsibility in the classroom, we see jobs, you know, simple things like who is the line leader or the line monitor for this week. Uh, we see job holders, you know, who is responsible for passing out papers or collecting books, who is responsible for, you know, these different uh, jobs and responsibilities and roles in the classroom. And this can happen at any grade level. We see this in K-12. Um, we see it in higher ed. I, my high school classes would have students that were responsible for, you know, distributing and collecting supplies. We had, you know, counting points or researching pieces. So there's different ways to share the power in the classroom. If you really want to get fancy, you could have students sort of, you know, you identify what the jobs are and then you can have students sort of apply for jobs. Um, and it's a way to put some value into this and, and make it meaningful for them. So there's a way to, you know, basically suggest that, you know what, instead of just something that you're given, why don't you sort of ask or request it? And then there can be a, a value add. There can be some sort of like prize or, or extra benefit for doing the jobs. In terms of empathy, it's really a great opportunity to build in reading resources and narrative, um, you know, picture books, chapter books, uh, different forms of text really give us a great opportunity to make human connections. They give us a way to talk about empathy, to talk about responsibility, compassion. I think that um, I love picture books. I love chapter books. I think that in K-12 and even with adults, picture books and chapter books are great ways to talk about tough subjects like being open-minded and let's focus on the picture book or chapter book and try and make sense of what that means to us and then what it might mean in our classroom. 
when we have lessons, we also want to think about building community and building culture and building group cohesion. And what that means is providing wait time. That means not always picking on the same individual. Um, it might mean if some students, you know, you might have the same two, three students that always answer, always respond, and they're the first to always answer and always respond. You may want to rephrase the question to build a little bit of wait time or a pause to allow the other students to think. You might give hints uh, along the way. We do this as classroom teachers all the time and slowly scaffold students as they think about where we are trying to head them. We can ask if there's other voices in the classroom. Are there other, uh, I say, melodious voices that I like to hear from? Uh, are there other students that would like to assist? And then also you can have like a turn and talk. So sometimes it's a little bit easier if our peers talk to each other first and then share with the class. So have a little bit of a turn and talk and um, then bring it back to the larger group. We want to think about the terminology that we use in the classroom. In my classroom, I didn't have very many rules and very many structures. Most of my classroom, the rule boiled down to the word respect. And language is very important to me. Language is important to me, uh, not just the, the literacy practices, but also the words that we use to describe ourselves and describe others. So in my classroom, there were some non-negotiables. There were certain things that were not acceptable at all. So respect was one of the key rules in my classroom. Um, for the most part, I did not really care that much if my students respected me. I didn't go into the year expecting uh, respect. What I did was I tried to create relationships with every single student and create a value add to those relationships. And I thought respect would come with that. But the non-negotiable for me was respecting others. I would not stand for a disrespect or uh, talking down to or bullying or name calling other learners that were trying in my classroom. Um, I predominantly taught in at-risk communities, and so most of my students, even in middle school and high school, were reading at a second or third grade reading level. It was not acceptable to me to have a student trying to read and then another student make fun of that person as being slow or a slow reader. That was a non-negotiable. That was not going to happen in my classroom. Pretty much everything else was okay but you are not going to talk down to or bully others. So let's talk about bullying. So bullying is a challenging construct. It's a challenging component of our classrooms. We're seeing evidence of bullying occur pretty early. We're seeing evidence of bullying start up in early childhood settings. Um, and so uh, we, we need to pay attention to what this is and what it could mean. Um, I also see early childhood teachers using the term bullying. And so we, we have to ask what, com, what, what does that do to our environment? So we want to think about how do we define a bully? Like bullying behaviors, it's one of those things like we know it when we see it. Um, but how do you define a bully? Uh, a question to ask yourself. Um, why do some students bully one another? You know, what are they really expressing? What's the value there in that interaction? Um, we also want to think about, is this something that has always happened? Is this something that children have always acted this way? Teens have always acted this way? Or is this something new? You know, is this just the internet age or just those kids? So when we think about bullying. We're going to identify or define bullying as unwanted aggressive behavior among children and adolescents that involves real or perceived power imbalance. So we're really focused on that power imbalance, those structural components where uh, they, they, there is um, inequity. The behavior is repeated or has the potential to be repeated over time. So we're focusing on repeated, you know, repeated uh, inequities or imbalance in that power and action that is trying to modify um, those imbalances. If we keep talking about bullying or thinking about bullying, we know that there are power differentials based upon 
age, gender, ability, social economic status, size. Um, the interesting piece is that bullying activities, bullying behaviors happen pretty quickly. So the average bullying incident lasts about 37 seconds. Um, it's pretty amazing that they go by that quickly. And that's by design. But bullying incidents go by pretty quick. They happen pretty quickly. And the, as a result, you know, and it's by design, teachers will only intervene every so often, you know, once in every 25 incidences. And so, you know, it's a 10% intervention on in the playground, 20% intervention in the classroom. So there's a lot of bullying that's happening, and it's happening very quickly, and we can't catch it all. So in terms of types of bullying, we know there's the physical, there's the relational. Now we're seeing incidences of cyberbullying. Uh, physical, pretty easy to tell what that is. We're talking about physical altercations, hitting, kicking, biting, pushing. Uh, relational is a lot of the social, emotional, the public embarrassment, the rumor spreading, um, talking junk about others. Uh, and then we see if incidences of cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is a uh, dangerous component that we're seeing uh, as our, our society moves increasingly online. A lot of our students are bringing devices into the building and hiding them. Um, we are engaged in social media and network communications, and so cyberbullying can occur pretty quickly. Um, I, When I first started doing my doctoral research, I, I read a story about students that were using Nintendo DSs as a way to uh, bully each other and send message, messages each other be, to each other because, and this was second graders and third graders, they were on the bus and they could, they realized I can send a message to somebody near me on the bus that also has a Nintendo DS. So we're looking at uh, the, the challenges of cyberbullying. And so there are instances where we exclude one another, we, we out other individuals, we impersonate, um, we, we pull, we create, you know, surveys about individuals or flame or denigrate other individuals that are supposed to be part of our group and our community. So we think about what happens in bullying. We see different characteristics. We see the, the impact on the, the bullies and the bullied. Um, if we look at the bullies, we, we recognize the fact that many, half of all bullies come from abusive homes. Uh, there's a tendency to watch more violent television. We have to ask questions about gaming and other media. Uh, a lot of our bullies show impulsive and oppos oppositional behaviors. And for the most part, we see that there's little remorse for victimization of others. So they, for the most part, don't care the impact on other individuals. In terms of the bullied, we recognize the fact that we see that they experience depression. Uh, we see evidence of PTSD, anxiety, withdrawal, uh, ideation of suicide. Uh, we see the impact on their self-esteem and self-worth. Um, and for the most part, we recognize the fact that the bullies and the bullied both it negatively impacts both groups so they're weighing each other down um, and so you might think that it's just the bullied um, that are negatively impacted but we see that both groups really achieve at a lower level if we try to unpack some of the differences between these groups we think we, we see evidence that boys are typically bullied by boys. Girls are typically bullied by boys and girls. Uh, boys are 2.5 times more likely to be a bully and victim. Um, for the most part, we're seeing that bullying peaks in elementary. And then throughout middle school and high school, it sort of wanes off. Um, we also know that there is increased likelihood of bullying behaviors in different populations. So uh, sexual minority youth, uh, individuals or students uh, with non-normative weight, uh, students that are acutely or chronically disabled, uh, different racial groups show evidence of increased likelihood for bullying behaviors, and then non-native speakers also are a little bit more at risk. So what do we do about it? So there's different ways that we can address this, and any bullying or anti-bullying, uh, you know, 
uh, program or initiative at a school is sometimes problematic. So if we look at uh, protective factors, we, we see that school and a sense of belonging and fairness and consistency and rules and culture at school, but also um, supportive, responsive nature of faculty and staff is important. We also notice that in the community, there are different factors that can sort of uh, protect against or create a situation where bullying is not accepted or non-negotiable. We think about neighborhood safety. We think about positive relationships with adults, you know, not just parents or guardians, but other adults um, in the community, you know, are adults generally seen as a positive force or are the adults also bullying other adults? So that's going to uh, negatively impact, we'll say, uh, the student's view of what value there is in bullying. If we think about bullying, it's also uh, important to think about the Basque model. In the Basque model, we're thinking about behavior, attitudes, skills, and knowledge. And it's basically a way to think about and address bullying in and out of our schools. So we think about behaviors when students make apologies, start small, um, we build up into attitudes, dispositional components like empathy, um, that we want to uh, empathize with other individuals and recognize that we have common ground, we have commonality. We want to move into skills and generally addressing uh, how to deal with bullying. So students should be thinking about skills, students should be taught to be assertive, talk about themselves, use that I message. We see that happening in relationship counseling. We see it happening in peer mediation where we train students to say, I felt this way when you, when I heard this. Uh, modeling strong body language, speak with confidence um, as opposed to the bullying behaviors. And last but not least, the K stands for knowledge. Bullies are generally skilled at gaining and, and using power over others. Uh, so there's opportunities to consider leadership opportunities and see positive outcomes of skills um, to support themselves, support others, and be a positive member of the community. So once again, there's a lot of different anti-bullying uh, initiatives and pledges. Not uh, No uh, anti-bullying initiative is the be-all, end-all. Um, there are significant challenges with a lot of these. Sometimes when we see anti-bullying pledges or initiatives, now we see incidences of bullying elevate because now students can put a name to the behavior. So it's, it's important to not just bring in an anti-bullying initiative, but also, you know, perhaps create it with the students or identify ways to have buy-in with the students. So maybe it's a class pledge that they have and everybody signs off. Um, but it's something that really should be a part of that classroom interaction loop. It should be something that builds group cohesion and something that is meaningful from uh, the class or the grade level or the building. And so one, one opportunity is a class pledge. Um, a, a opportunity to think about civil rights of others, think about ability and prejudice uh, and opposing hate. Um, this is something that we increasingly see in our schools. And so this pledge here might be of value to you. We think about bullying. We also want to understand uh, the impact on regulation, uh, emotional regulation, finding that balance, finding a way to situate ourselves and, and our students in between generally positive and negative, not get too high, not get too low. And to achieve emotional regulation, we want to understand the, the mixture between gratitude, giving gratitude, receiving gratitude, appreciating others, generally being thankful for others, but then also that respect component that I talked about before. We're going to fold into this mixture a general understanding of empathy and, and connecting with others and recognizing the experience of others and figure out, okay, how can I be supportive of other individuals, other students in my classroom? If we think about gratitude, uh, gratitude leads to greater appreciation for others, increased happiness, 
Um, there are ways to have this happen in our classroom. We can have students uh, identify or use gestures or acts or words uh, that show that they are uh, they have appreciation. We have instances where we can have giving in our classroom. We can compare patterns and share in groups or journals. There is an opportunity to talk about filling each other's bucket. Um, this might be uh, you filling the bucket of students or students hopefully filling your bucket or students filling the bucket of others, but generally just appreciation and expressing kindness for others and making kindness a habit in your classroom. Different ways to deal with regulation. Uh, we can think about uh, identifying emotional triggers, thinking about alternate ways to deal with this. Um, so when students deal with an issue, we could say, all right, well, let's recognize what you're feeling. Let's stop and think. Let's take three deep breaths and try and go outside of your shell and then come back to me or come out of your shell when you're calm and you think of a solution. So providing those mechanisms for students to deal with emotional triggers and thinking about different responses. Just said a different way. It's not lashing out. It's taking the time to figure out, okay, what are different ways or better ways for us to deal with these situations? We also uh, have an opportunity to test out the second step curriculum in our classes. Um, we can focus on empathy and perspective taking, conflict resolution, uh, different ways to avoid fights, avoid the, avoid the physicality. To uh, We show evidence in the second step curriculum about managing anger. Um, and it's creating those partnerships between students and uh, faculty, the adults in the building, faculty and staff, I should say. Um, and part of it is make school, make the relationships a little bit more relevant, make school fun. And so that's the second time in, in, in two chapters I've been talking about having fun in our classroom. Um, last but not least, we really want to focus on the isolated students. We don't want to you know, many times in our classroom, we we value, we like the students that do well and they do everything that we ask. And we enjoy the fact that they're always asking, and always responsive. And many times in our classroom, we focus on the students that are the disciplinary problems and they get our attention because they're calling out or or bullying or other activities. And and we we miss the students that are in between. We miss those students that they ju do just enough to slide by and they're not an annoyance. And so we miss those students that sort of like just float in the ether. And we want to think about those isolated students. And we, you need to take time, I believe, you should take time to uh, like and respect that student. And, and hunt those students down and always look for those students in your classroom. And find traits about them that you like. Find qualities or hobbies that you value in them. Um, employ the power of collective rewards um, to, you know, sort of reward behaviors when you see it. Help students self-regulate as we discussed earlier. Um, different ways to do this. Give some of those special duties or jobs to certain students, you know, that they are a value add and that they can basically help you out. Um, and then also make them a buddy, you know, make them the, the teacher's pet or the teacher's assistant as a better way to make those connections. So to wrap up this chapter, a couple different uh, components. Uh, first off, um, model respectful behavior. Think about your behavior in the classroom, the way you interact with uh, your students, the way you interact with your peers. Um, what sort of uh, exa example are you using in your classroom? Also, we want to identify uh, and support positive interactions in active learning. Um, we, you know, th there are different ways that we can help build empathy, but also build those emotional regulatory activities. We want to take bullying seriously. Um, we talked earlier about how often bullying and how quickly bullying is occurring and how often we respond to it. Um, it's one of those things we really want to pay attention to. Um, we want to intervene immediately um, and, and immediately unpack it and talk to students and, and try and address the situation and then call back up as, if necessary. Um, if you can't immediately get in and talk, then we want to call in back up and that might, might be administrators or other adults or other individuals that are in the building. 
And then, and we want to hold students accountable for misbehavior. We want to just go back to those classroom rules and consequences without being um, negative uh, or uh, punitive in our punishments. So with that, hopefully you're all doing well. Um, and I enjoyed uh, reviewing this section with all of you.